Yeah, a lot of questions about that one. Welcome to the story. I'm Maggie Vespa. We actually didn't see, we couldn't tell what was happening at the fence line that uh, basically prompted, for lack of a better word, officers to deploy tear gas. So even with the zoning, I just kind of want to show you how random fire season can be. And to show you what we mean, we're sending up our drone. And they don't really care about the press or about public support. And that movement is way stronger here in Portland, in the Portland area. And they've also admitted multiple times, including today, that they screwed up in hiring him. But we hear you loud and clear. We see your emails. We know this is happening in several local districts. We press sources presenting the opposing viewpoints, vetting their answers, and pointing out logical holes when we hear them, and then we let them respond. That's kind of what I'm getting at. What can be done in the meantime? You, you, you know I don't give specific timelines, and you know why. No, I don't. Why not? They said you were a proud boy. It's it's and you say you're not and there's no national registry that anybody can check. Like that could be a yes. 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 This is video I shot on my cell phone Tuesday. A homeless camp caught fire along I-405 at Northwest 14th and Cooch. As firefighters worked to put it out, an ODOT staffer started yelling. There's I moved back across the street. Zooming in, you can see another reason why firefighters were so afraid. This patch of land has bushes and trees, all dry fuel primed to go up in flames as cars cruise by. We went back Friday. That tent was gone, and a man camping nearby didn't want to talk to us. Firefighters don't know how this started. They don't think anyone was hurt. Then I started seeing black smoke coming up from this spot right here. Wesley Mahan lives nearby and watched flames spread. He knows it could have been worse. I immediately saw that all the vines on the lattice work for the bridge here had burnt at least for, uh, it looks like, about 15 feet. Mahan was struck by this. Firefighters are not. We have a, um, a real concern this year. In the last year, Portland's housing crisis appears to have grown at historic rates. This week, we learned calls about camps catching fire have spiked too. In January of 2020, Portland Fire got 67 of these calls. By July, it was up to 114. Since then, they've taken well over 100 calls per month. So far this month, they've had 157. That's a 134% spike since the start of 2020. It's a main concern of the fire chief. A main concern because people are getting hurt, says Lieutenant Rich Chapman, but also because heading into summer, our area's moisture content is alarmingly low, a.k.a. the same reality that fuels wildfire fears in rural wooded areas now has urban firefighters worried too. What makes Portland so beautiful, Forest Park, um, all these different areas where we have lots of trees and um, lots of great vegetation, beautiful stuff, and especially when it where it butts up right here to the city in these urban areas. Um, it not only becomes a fire risk, it becomes a health and safety risk. A risk to highway infrastructure when fires start on ODOT land and a risk to businesses and homes in other cases. This week, a viewer sent us these photos of a homeless camp that caught fire along North Portland's Peninsula Crossing Trail. You can see all the trees and grass. You can also see houses in the background. They're not far away. We don't know if anyone was hurt. Chapman says the main causes of these fires are people trying to stay warm, provide light, and cook food. It leaves many, like Mahan, torn. He's made a point to meet a lot of people living on the streets. You try and help where you can, you know, but you still, you still want to preserve where you live and not have it go, go up in flames. Um, and thank you, uh, media, for showing up on such short notice. This is a story of how quickly a wrongful accusation can go from a single post on Facebook. Uh, yeah, we have we have a little bit of breaking news. To a full-fledged press conference and calls for an investigation. Um, I want to be very clear. There is an accusation that threatens to damage my reputation. In fact, these two live streams happened just hours apart. Before we dive into how or why, it's important you know Portland City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty has been completely cleared of any involvement in a hit and run crash that happened at Southeast 148th and Burnside Wednesday. The commissioner herself says she doesn't even drive. I take these allegations very seriously and am here today to tell you that the allegations are false. 
That didn't stop the allegation that Hardesty rear-ended a woman and fled from spreading like wildfire. Here's how. It all started around 9 a.m. Thursday. Members of the Coalition to Save Portland went live on Facebook. The man speaking here is Jeff Reynolds, former chairman of the Multnomah County Republican Party. In that Facebook Live, Reynolds and his fellow coalition members said they'd been tipped off about the hit and run by a source, which led them to request the police report. In that report, they said the victim in the crash told police she thought the driver was City Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. The allegation had not been investigated, and by the end of the day, Hardesty would be cleared by police. But that took hours, and this Facebook Live now has dozens of shares and thousands of views. The group also posted what reads like a news release, saying they, quote, broke the news about Hardesty's involvement in the crash. Within hours, other mostly right-wing activists started tweeting and posting about the wrongful allegation. By noon that day, Commissioner Hardesty had gotten so many questions about this, she scheduled that live press conference. This appears to be part of a coordinated spear campaign perpetrated by Jeff Reynolds, former chair of the Multnomah County Republican Party. Hours after that, Portland police put out a statement clearing the commissioner. Members of the coalition to save Portland have denied Hardesty's smear campaign allegation against Reynolds, but they haven't updated their posts or website to say Hardesty has been cleared. So that content is still undoubtedly being discovered by new people. Gabriel Johnson, co-founder of the coalition, spoke with me Friday afternoon. Do you have any regrets in putting it out the way you did? It's a public record, and I think the public records need to be uh, need to be put out. And so, so no, I don't have any, we don't have any regrets, and we would do it again. I don't want to be here no more. I've been too. It's been too long to deal with an environment as chaotic as this. No one life. we met living along Laurelhurst Park thinks this is working. That includes Christopher Kirby, who's been homeless since he was 13. I don't know how to live like you. But whether it's working or not, this is what's happening. Six months after the city cleared campers from this southeast Portland neighborhood, dozens are back. And this time, activists followed. We wouldn't be here if people didn't ask us to be here. Um, Stop the Sweeps is one of a few groups here. They make campers food and vow to, in their minds, provide protection from the city. You know, this is a collaborative effort with the residents and with the organizations to to protect them against the sweeps. The problem is many here are battling addiction and mental health issues, and this setup has bred chaos. Neighbors are exhausted and afraid. People know our names. Yeah. And I, I, we worry about that. That's, that's our only concern. One couple only wanted to talk via phone for fear of retribution. They live near the camp and say they've endured threats, theft, and attempted break-ins. They hear screams at night. Early Monday morning, they took this photo after a tent exploded. There were uh, those propane tanks next to the fire. It was a huge, I mean, it was, it was massive fire. It wasn't Campers say it was an accident and no one was hurt. There's many people who want to make this a housed against unhoused situation. And that is just simply not truthful or accurate. TJ Browning is the safety chair of the Neighborhood Association. This situation victimizes the housed and the unhoused. She calls this a lose-lose situation and puts all the blame on City Hall. She thinks city officials don't get how frightening this has been and how much people in this camp need serious help. Here's one story she told us. We had a child come out of their front door into their front yard. A woman, a mental health issues, I, I understand. I have empathy and compassion. However, she saw that child, came running across the park, across the parking strip to him, and was screaming at him, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to kill you. After months of neighbors submitting complaints and documenting concerns, KGW learned of a possible breakthrough, a meeting Friday afternoon between the city and activists here. A rep confirms staff from all five city commissioner's offices were there, adding the city has flagged multiple safety and sanitation concerns that warrant clearing the camp. Granted, Browning wishes the neighborhood could have also been at Friday's meeting.
We're not invited. We're not invited. Still, activists said these conversations could lead to campers leaving voluntarily. In short, Benjamin Donlin told us amid a booming housing crisis and a pandemic, campers feel safe living like this, but it doesn't have to be here. Give them land to build organized tiny house villages, he says, and people will gladly move. I think that if the city allowed for people to autonomously build up their own communities, that you would see a lot of unhoused people provide for themselves in really strong ways. KGW is waiting on the results of that meeting. So are neighbors who will remind you the city has promised to take care of this before. Maggie Vespa, KGW News.